Welcome to Lecture 2, 2D Vectors. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss scalars and vectors and vector operations in general, and then move on to discuss how we're going to use vectors to deal with forces in our statics problems. All of the physical quantities that we encounter in engineering mechanics are either scalars or vectors. A scalar is a physical quantity that possesses only magnitude, whereas a vector possesses both magnitude and direction. Let's focus on scalars first. Can you think of any examples of physical quantities that have only magnitude? Mass is one, time, volume, density, energy. These are just a few examples of scalars. Vectors, on the other hand, have both magnitude and direction. Can you think of any physical quantities that meet the definition of a vector? Force, we discussed force being a vector uh, a little bit in lecture one. Displacement, velocity, acceleration. These are all examples of physical quantities that are vectors. They have both magnitude and direction. We will be making extensive use of force and displacement vectors in statics. We show vectors graphically by an arrow where the length of the arrow represents the vector's magnitude, where the angle between the arrow and a fixed axis defines the vector's line of action. and where the head or tip of the arrow indicates the vector's sense of direction. We can multiply and divide vectors by scalars. For example, if we start off with a vector A, note that Vector A has both magnitude and direction. If we multiply vector A by the number two, we double the magnitude of A, but notice that its direction remains the same. If we multiply the vector A by a negative 1.5, Notice that its magnitude increases and its sense of direction is reversed because of the negative sign. Likewise, if we multiply A by 0 0.5, which is the same as dividing it by two, the direction stays the same, but its magnitude is cut in half. Now I'll discuss vector addition using two different methods. The first method is known as the parallelogram law of addition. We can use the parallelogram law to find the sum of two vectors, and that sum is known as the resultant, and we will call that R in our example here. So, here are two vectors, A and B. To use the parallelogram law, we redraw them with their tails connected at a common point. Notice their direction and magnitude have not changed. We've just redrawn them, connected together. 
And also notice that we've created two sides of a parallelogram with A and B. So to use the parallelogram law, what we're going to do is complete this parallelogram by drawing a line parallel to B starting at the head of A, head or tip of A. And we'll do the same thing at the tip of B, draw a line parallel to A. And we're interested in this intersection here, the point where those two new lines intersect. Notice that we now have a parallelogram. And now the vector R that we can draw from our original vertex where A and B meet out to that new point we've created on the other side, the other corner of the parallelogram, that vector now represents the sum of vectors A and B. And again, we call that sum, that vector, the resultant vector, and we usually denote that with the letter R. The second method that we'll be looking at for vector addition is known as the triangle rule. Now with the triangle rule, you draw the vectors tail to tip instead of tail to tail like we did in the for the parallelogram law. And then your resultant vector is drawn from the point where you started to the point where the second vector ended up. And it doesn't matter which order you draw these in. Note that drawing A and then B yields the same resultant as B plus A. Now the parallelogram law and the triangle rule are known as graphical methods. You're going to be using trigonometry to solve for the angles and sides associated with the triangles created uh, when using either the parallelogram law or the triangle rule. Now let's look at the vector addition of forces. We've established that force is a vector quantity. So given any two forces, we can sum them and find the resultant force using either the parallelogram law or the triangle rule and some trigonometry to solve for the magnitude and direction of the resultant. Now note that the parallelogram law and triangle rule can both be applied to situations where there's more than two forces. Suppose you had three forces and you wanted to use the parallelogram law. What you would do is take two of the forces, find the resultant of those two forces, and then take the third force and that resultant that you just found and find the resultant from that. And then that is the resultant of all three forces. The triangle rule can be used in a similar manner, but we really need a better way to deal with uh, summing forces when uh, in a more general case where there are multiple forces. By using the parallelogram law in reverse, we can take a given force and resolve it into two components along any two axes. So let's look at this example. We're given force F. We know its magnitude and direction, and we want to resolve it into components, one along the V-axis and one along the U-axis. So there's some force along the V-axis and some force along the U-axis that when they're added together will result in the force F. So we use the parallelogram law in reverse. We draw a parallel line from the tip of F 
back to the v-axis that's parallel to the u-axis and do the same by drawing a line from the tip of f parallel to the v-axis back to the u-axis and then we're interested in these points here and then we draw in our component vectors along each axis to those points. Now looking over at the, the B figure here where it's cleaner, we can see that now those two components, which we'll call F, F sub V and F sub U, are the components along the V and U axis of the force F. And you should be able to see the, the parallelogram law in effect here. Now, we know the directions of F of F sub V and F of F sub U because those axes, the directions of those axes are established. We're going to use trigonometry to solve for the magnitude of those component forces. While we can resolve a force into two components along any two axes, the axes will usually be the X and Y axes. When this is the case, the components are known as the rectangular components of the force. Let's look at this. In this example, we have a force of known magnitude and direction. When we use the parallelogram law in reverse, the parallelogram is now a rectangle which is going to make our trigonometry easier, easier. And when we're working in what's known as scalar notation, we're interested in the scalar components of F, which are the magnitude of the vector F sub X, which is the component of F along the X axis, and the magnitude of F sub Y, which is the magnitude of the vector component of F along the Y axis. And we calculate those by, we'll do F sub X first. As you can see, we have a right triangle now there because the parallelogram is a rectangle. So the magnitude of F sub X is going to be the magnitude of F times the cosine of theta. The magnitude of F sub Y is F times the sine of theta. Now note here that I'm using bold letters to represent vectors. F sub Y is a vector. F is a vector. F sub X is a vector, but when I'm working in scalar notation and I just want to indicate the magnitude of these vectors, I don't bold them. When you're writing these by hand, you would show the vector F by writing F and then putting an arrow over top of it. And you would show the magnitude of F, which is a scalar just by writing a regular F. And that's the convention I use throughout the lectures and in the course. Now that we know how to calculate the scalar components of a force vector, Let's look at how we can express a force as a Cartesian vector using Cartesian vector notation. To do this, we're going to make use of unit vectors, which are two vectors of magnitude one. Unit vectors always have a magnitude of one that are directed along the positive x and y axes. And we're going to note, denote them by i and j respectively. i is a unit vector along the x-axis, j is a unit vector along the 
y-axis. If we're writing these by hand, we would write i with a circumflex over it to designate that it's a unit vector and j with a circumflex over it. So looks, let's look at our force again here. We have a force of known magnitude and direction. We learned when talking about scalar notation on the previous slide how to calculate the magnitude of the y component of the force and the magnitude of the x component of the force. Specifically, f sub y is going to be f sine theta and f sub x is going to be f cosine theta. So now to express this vector f in Cartesian form, we write the vector f equals the magnitude of the vector component f sub x times the unit vector i plus the magnitude of the y component of f times the unit vector j. So where are we going with scalar notation and Cartesian vector notation? Well, we're going to use these tools to help us determine coplanar force resultants. In other words, we're going to have a number of forces that exist in a single plane, in our case, usually the XY plane uh, in our 2D work. And we'll use the tools to help us add those forces together to produce a single force resultant. Now we can work coplanar force problems in either scalar notation or Cartesian vector no notation. I recommend using Cartesian vector notation. Um, you almost have to use it when we get into the 3D problems um, because of the complex bookkeeping uh, requirements in the problems, keeping track of all the different uh, components and variables and everything. But you can use scalar notation in 2D and 3D if you prefer. It's up to you. But most students find that uh, Cartesian uh, is the way to go. So let's consider uh, a concurrent force system consisting of the forces F sub 1, F sub 2, and F sub 3. Now, what do we mean by con concurrent? Concurrent means that the lines of action of all three of the forces we're looking at here pass through a common point. Okay, and these forces are coplanar because we're working in the XY plane 2D uh, world. Now we're going to use a three-step process to determine the resultant force produced by these three forces. Step one is going to be to resolve each of the three forces into their I and J components. So let's go to our diagram here, which we've shown a little bit differently now. Remember that this is force F sub 1. This is force F sub 2. And this is force F sub 3. So if we, if we write F sub 1 in Cartesian form, or in terms of its i and j components, we're going to write that F sub 1 equals 
f sub 1 x i plus f sub 1 y j. f sub 2, a little bit different. Look at f sub 2 x. Notice that it is going in the negative x direction, so we're going to put a negative sign there. f sub 2 y is in the positive y direction, so that sign would be positive. And a similar thing with f sub 3. f sub 3x is in the positive direction, but f sub 3y is in the negative y direction, so there's going to be a negative sign there. Our second step is going to be to add all of the I components together and all of the J components together. In other words, we're going to gather like terms, just like we do in algebra. So let's go back to our basic resultant equation. We've said that the resultant, which says that the resultant of the three forces is equal to F sub R. And what we're going to do is now we're going to substitute in for F sub 1, F sub 2, and F sub 3 with their Cartesian vectors. So for F sub 1, we're going to put in F sub 1 xi plus F sub 1 yj. For F sub 2, we're going to put in negative F sub 2 xi plus f sub 2 yj, and for f sub 3, we're going to put in f sub 3 xi minus f sub 3 yj. So a common uh, mistake when you're working these problems is the minus signs. So don't forget your minus signs. Now we're going to gather like terms, and we should be able to see that here's an I term, here's an I term, again don't forget the minus sign, here's the third I term, and similar for the J terms, again don't forget to carry through your minus signs. And then from here, we're going to write the resultant force in the x direction, which is the resultant of these three x components. Now, what is that? That, that is, I'm adding together three vectors that all have the same line of action, which is the x-axis. So I can just now add those numerically. In other words, I'm going to take f sub 1x, the magnitude of f sub 1x, subtract the magnitude of f sub 2x from it, and then add the magnitude of f, f sub 3x. And the result of that is the resultant of those three vectors that all have the same line of action, which is the x-axis. And I'm going to do the same thing with the y with the j terms. Basically, we'll just be adding these three numbers together, f sub 1y, f sub 2y, and f sub 3y. Notice there's still a negative sign there. And that's going to give me the resultant in the y direction. Step three is to determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. Now, if you're not told otherwise, the 
you'll give the direction of the force as the angle with respect to the x-axis shown here is theta. Sometimes the problem will ask uh, to for you to give the direction with respect to the y-axis or, or, or clockwise from the y-axis or counterclockwise from the x-axis. So you have to look out for that. But the default is uh, the angle from the x-axis. So in step two, we determine these numbers by just adding together the magnitudes of the respective uh, like components of the original forces. And we ended up with a resultant force along the x-axis and a resultant force along the y-axis. And now we're going to use the, I mean, basically the uh, uh, parallelogram law or the reverse of the rectangular component method that we used. And we're going to, we can calculate the magnitude of of the resultant force of all three of the original forces using the Pythagorean theorem, just basically c squared equals a squared plus b squared, where this is c, f sub f sub r x is a and f sub r y is b. Okay, so I take the square root of both sides and that's where the radical comes from. And then I can find the direction angle theta using trig where I know that the tangent of theta is equal to, again, using uh, a and B, which I had, I put on the drawing here. The tangent of theta is going to be equal to B over A, or theta is going to equal the inverse tan of B over A. And B over A is just the magnitude of the Y component of the resultant force over the magnitude of the X component of the resultant force.